Why, hi there, I'm Ron Juckett. Joining me today is Drew Douglas from District on Deck, and we have the pleasure of chatting with Chelsea James of the Washington Post. How are you today? Pretty good. How about you guys? I am fine. Drew, how are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> All right, let's start with the obvious question. What's the deal with Steven Strasburg, and is this something we should worry about? It's always something you should worry about with him. I mean, you guys know as well as anyone how, you know, kind of, Finicky, I guess he could be, um, for lack of a better word. But you know, when when you hear forearm achiness, you start to really get worried. In this case, I actually kind of feel like he just feels a little off from the All Star break and doesn't feel quite right. I mean, the results were fine; his stuff was fine. But we've seen that before too. So I'm kind of just in a holding pattern personally and thinking, okay, maybe it's nothing. Maybe they'll clear it out; it'll be fine. But he doesn't have a history of things just being fine. So I think it's definitely something to kind of keep an eye on for sure. Wouldn't there have been his first start? Yeah, he said it did. He said it was actually worse um, the first start after the break and than it was yesterday. Was that yesterday? Yesterday. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, I guess he, you know, through all those pitches, figured – let's just shut it down here and not deal with this anymore. But yeah, that's the interesting thing is he threw seven innings, allowed a run and struck out, I think 11 when this was going on. So how bad can it really be? But you know, with him, it, it can get bad fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So I'll ask the question then. I mean, how soon is Eric Fetty going to be if, if he needs to yeah, come up? Yeah, I think he's getting close. You know, they, they put him down in the bullpen and sort of, you know, made him a little more compact in terms of stamina for a couple months there. I think that was the plan, they say, was to, to make it a short stint and then build him back up. So he's still building. Um, had a couple rough outings early on, I'm sure you guys saw. But I think, you know, that, that he's a realistic option maybe in August. Um, you know, and if, even if Steven has to miss his next start, I wouldn't totally rule it out. But, you know, they've shown a willingness to go to guys pretty early, maybe before they're even ready. Gigalito, Lopez, you can, you know, go up and down the list. But so I wouldn't be surprised to see him in August. I would be fairly confident that you'd see him in September unless, you know, something performance-wise or physically isn't where they want it. Okay, Drew. No, after the duel and Madison trade, do you think the Nationals are done dealing? I don't think anyone else does. You know, no one else in baseball seems to think they're done. Um, we really haven't seen them take on that much money before at the deadline. I mean, Melanson was a big deal for one year, but, that, you know, obviously Madison is a little – are going to be there next year and perhaps beyond with Doolittle. So that was kind of a big get financially. So I don't know what that does to them in terms of being able to add payroll. Obviously, a lot of, a lot of helpful relievers wouldn't add a lot of payroll. So I think they're going to keep poking around. You know, names like Neshek and Wilson keep coming up for good reason. I think the Nats are interested, and, you know, why not? But it's just a question of, if we're going to have to give up Victor Robles for two months of Pat Neshek, that's probably not something we're going to do. If we're going to be able to make a deal and give up a bunch of prospects for Justin Wilson, then maybe that's something they would think about. So I, you know, I, I just think it's going to depend where the market goes, and you know, the market's been a little bit unpredictable this year, and and I think maybe if they can find a steal, um, or a deal like the Madsen Doolittle deal, it's kind of good both ways. Then then maybe you'll see another one. So they've been connected to setup type guys like Pat Neshek and also closers such as like uh, Rysel Iglesias with Cincinnati and Justin Wilson in Detroit. Do you think it'd be more likely to see them go get a setup type man or a proven closer? You know, I think I think they feel like Sean Doolittle and Ryan Madsen can be proven closers. Um, but when I talked to them, you know, just listening earlier this year, I was surprised at how much they said, we want a closer. You know, that was like the thing, you know, and you, you'd bring up names, they'd be like, oh, and he's not a closer. And it was kind of like, well, wait, don't you just need, you know, whatever help you can get? I think that might have changed because I think they feel really good about what Dougal and Madsen bring. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if they think they can get a controllable closer type. I think they'd reach for him. But but I think they would settle for a setup guy, you know, a Justin, you know, I mean, Justin Wilson can close, but, you know, maybe a, not a proven closer, not a Zach Britton type, but somebody who's like a little bit below that would still help them a whole lot and maybe not require you to sell off Juan Soto and Victor Robles and all these guys you you really want to play around. So if they don't actually make a trade, do we think that we now know what roles pitchers might fill in that bullpen, or are we still going to just throw darts against the wall until October? 
It feels a little darts against the Wally. Uh, you know, I'll be interested to see if Sean Doolittle continues to close. He's obviously shown that he can handle adversity, but he's, you know, putting himself in some compromising situations and he's not totally durable. Um, Madsen's looked great. I actually did not expect him to look as good as he has. I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, 98 on the score, you know, on the scoreboard on TV and thought like, whoa, whoa the 98. Um, and that's pretty consistent. So I think he's a guy who's looked really good. Maybe they'll try him in that role. But you know, until you figure out how healthy Sean Kelly is and how healthy Coda ends up being whenever he comes back, I, I think they're going to still be feeling. Because, you know, Sean Kelly is 2015 or 2016 Sean Kelly when he gets back. That's a really nice seventh inning guy. I mean, he was great. Yeah. If he's, you know, nine home runs and 18 innings Sean Kelly, then he's probably irrelevant. So I think they're going to kind of feel it out. I think they can afford to. Um, but right now it still feels a little – little random and and like Dusty's probably tearing his hair out down there whatever hair he has left trying to kind of figure out where everyone fits you mentioned you mentioned Coda Glover have you heard any updates on him and Trey Turner from West Palm Beach Trey I have um Trey is gonna get an x-ray I think tomorrow in DC and you know knowing the Nationals will probably find the results out about that like Friday or some ridiculous amount of time afterward but um I think they expect that to be fine you know I think they really think Trey Turner is going to be okay it was one of those things that even after it happened you know minutes after it happened he's like fooling with his luggage and nothing on his wrist I mean it was a small break and as soon as it's healed I think he'll be full go so if they get the kind of okay on that this week I mean he could be back in, in two weeks or something like that but even maybe even sooner but Hoda I think has started to throw he's kind of the wild card because that shoulder thing kind of came out of nowhere and We've, you know, I mean, shoulders are a big deal, and he's got a lot going on. I mean, he's got the hip, he's got the shoulder. It's kind of like, yikes. So I think they're going to be really slow with him. He might be a guy who you don't see, I mean, September, and then if he looks like good, then he's going to be fresh. He won't have a lot of innings, and that'll be great. But he feels to me like the farthest off of, of absolutely everyone, maybe save Adam Eden, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how long that ends up or if I'm totally wrong. <laughs> What about Michael Taylor? About Michael Taylor? Uh, yeah, he, you know, we, I mean, we've all seen this a million times with the oblique, how it just like feels like it's nothing and then it's something. Um, but, you know, he tried to do baseball stuff this week, didn't, couldn't tolerate it. But he's been running around, you know, we've seen him out there, you know, with the trainers before the games, um, the last few games of the road trip, which I think is good. So once we see him swing, I think that'll be a really good sign. But I would actually... You know, if, if you think maybe Jason Worth is back in the first week in August, I don't know that we'll see Michael Taylor before that either. There's really no reason to rush it. So I think I think he's a little ways off, actually, it, especially if he hasn't started the baseball stuff yet because and he's got to go out and play and, and get back at it. So they're, they're going to be careful. But if he picks up a bat and swings tomorrow, that that's a totally different story. So I think there's a lot of maybe this is what you're getting from me. And, and I think that's sort of how they feel right now, too. So are they going to be pressed to have to go out and get an outfielder at the deadline, or do they feel comfortable right now with who they have? I got a hard no on that yesterday from Rizzo, and I think, um, you know, Brian Goodwin's played his way into being a really nice player. Um, they think they can patch together left field for a little while here. I think every expectation is that Worth will be back when those 60 days are up since they just moved in for 60 days. I think that would be the first week in August. So they're, they're optimistic they can get through it. Um, that said, I wouldn't expect it to be – if they were to go get somebody, I would expect one of those kind of post-trade deadline waiver type deals, just kind of like a little rental. But I don't think that's even on the radar right now. I think they feel like they can fill. Ryan Rayburn will come back, which, you know, doesn't make anyone feel great. But it's something. You know, it's a professional hitter. And I think they're fine with that middle of the lineup, Brian Goodwin playing the way he is, and then sort of piecing everything together, throw Adam Lind out there a little bit, maybe even Defoe, which has been adventurous. But – Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, I, you know, I think they feel all right. And, and honestly, like, with their situation, it'd be kind of silly to give up too much to go get somebody you're going to need for two weeks or whatever it is. Okay. True. And, um, with all these injury updates, do, uh, let's focus a little bit on the Nationals on-field players. Of the Nationals' five MVP candidates, Ryan Zimmerman, Daniel Murphy, Bryce Harper, Anthony Rendon, and Max Scherzer, who do you think has the best chance of winning the National League MVP award? I think Harper, you know, I think Zim's kind of come down a little bit. Um, Murphy's, I feel like, if, you know, Murphy's on a team with Bryce Harper, he's never going to win that. Um, and then Rendon's been amazing. I mean, I, some people floated his name, I think, maybe to me in early July, and I was kind of like, no. 
And then it's like, well, I mean, actually, like, look at this guy. I mean, he's been that throw in the ninth the other day aside. He's been almost perfect defensively. He's just been incredibly steady. And, uh, but he, I, you know, I don't think you can choose Anthony Rendon over Harper. Scherzer's really interesting. I mean, Scherzer is somebody you look at and you're like, well, actually, kind of maybe. But I think it's hard to pick a pitcher on a team like this where, in my opinion anyway, where, you know, there's so clearly so much offensive talent that's in there every day. You know, it's kind of hard just by taking him over Harper. But, I mean, just the fact that you're even talking about five candidates is so absurd. You know, that's what hit me at the All-Star game. Like, oh, my gosh, what are we even talking about here? It's, it's pretty crazy. And and those five guys are the reason they don't have to worry about all this other stuff because they've had a lot happen this year. It hasn't been easy, but – those guys are so steady, it almost doesn't matter. Yeah, no, no, exactly. All right, let me put you on the spot here. Uh, let's first ask about Bryce Harper. His, of course, next year is his last year. Uh, we talked to Byron Kerr, I believe it was last week, and he said the chances were 50-50 that he would stay. Would you agree with that? I'd put him lower. Um, I've always had kind of a, uh, I guess from an ads fan's perspective, dismal prognosis on this one. I think there's just very little history of guys signing big deals with the teams that they came up with. I think, you know, Barry Sperluga, my colleague, looked it up, and it, this exact stat is beyond me right now, but I think it was like 25 guys signing big deals in free agency, and one of them, you know, the 25 biggest deals, one of them re-signed with his team, and that was Chris Davis, who's, you know, a little bit different than a Bryce Harper in terms of his versatility. So, I mean, it just doesn't happen. And I think I think that my answer's changed on this. I think at the beginning of the year, I thought, no way. I think also when Steven Strasburg came back, I thought, no way. So that kind of made me think maybe we don't know what these guys are thinking. But just the way Harper performs in those big stages, the way he seems to love Wrigley and Fenway, and he's just like a little kid in those situations – you can understand the appeal of going to a big market, but you know, I, I think he's he is realizing or does realize that he's treated really well in DC, both by fans, management. You know, they really go out of their way for him, and I think that that's something that will end up factoring. So, you know, if if the Yankees decide they don't need to spend on Bryce Harper, which they might not, if you know, you just don't know what the market's even going to be. I think that maybe the Nats will benefit from that, but I'm I'm fairly. I would be surprised if he comes back. I'd put it that way, but you know, I would have said that about Steven Strasburg too, and would have been horribly wrong. So who knows? What about the other big potential free agent, Daniel Murphy? He doesn't get the attention, but his deal is up at the end of next year. Does he stay? That's a good question. I mean, that's one it's really hard to get a sense of. I think he has really enjoyed being not under the New York spotlight. I think he's really found a nice, comfortable place here, and he's hit like it for sure. Um, he knows the division. He knows he knows where he is. I think he's become a really nice presence in the locker room. So, you know, I think the Nats will make a run at him for sure. It's just, you know, is somebody else going to outbid to a point that they're not comfortable with given his age? But, I mean, he's been a real game changer for them, honestly. And, and everyone talks about him, you know, on the field and all that. But it, it, in the clubhouse, it's, in, it's really incredible. I mean, it seems like once a week somebody says, oh, yeah, Murphy said this to me and it changed my whole – night and you're just like wow this guy just this is always happening and um so I, you know i think he's a really big presence in there and, and brings something that they they didn't have offensively and i think they'll really you know i think they'll make a nice run at him but you know, he might have priced himself out of a reasonable contract for a guy who's going to be in his you know mid to late 30s when he's getting you know this money right drew do you have anything else but yeah kind of going back to the bullpen a little bit Matt Grace has quickly turned into one of their most reliable and versatile relievers. I mean, he's closing games in Cincinnati. He's coming in as a long man. When some of the relievers, such as Sean Kelly and Coda Glover, come back, do you see Matt Grace sticking with the team? Because he's really the only reliever out in the pen that has options left. Yeah, I know, you know, I was thinking about that too. I mean, he's pitched himself into being, you know, not only like opening eyes, but being sort of indispensable lately. And you kind of hope this weekend doesn't, set him off because he, you know, threw 31 pitches Friday and 34 Sunday, which is obviously a lot. Um, but I, mean, I think Dusty likes him. I think Maddox likes him. He's one of those guys who sort of just does what he's supposed to do every time. He's not going to walk the park. He's, you know, going to throw strikes to Paul Goldschmidt like he is to a pitcher. So I think, I think he's really impressed them. Um, but it's going to be tight. I mean, I don't know. You know, I think they've always found their way out of decisions like this. You know, somebody gets hurt and then they have to, you know, and then there's a spot again. But I think, you know, obviously you can expand the bullpen a little bit in the playoffs, and I think he's really 
made a strong case that when you go to that eight man bullpen, I mean, he'll certainly be there in September, but when you start to maybe have an extra spot or two, you know, it's hard to think that anyone else has earned it more than he has, but 15 million Joe Bland's got 4 million better. It's, you know, where's the spot, but if nothing else, they've found somebody that's probably going to be a part of things next year. And, and any solid reliever they find at this point is a huge find for them. And I think they're really happy with what they've gotten from him. All right. All right. Thank you very much for coming to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So let's go to the Washington Post. Hi. Bye-bye. All right, Drew. Well, you know, that was, well, that was a very in intelligent conversation. Um, what struck you? Um, I kind of was a little bit surprised by her answer to Daniel Murphy about how uh, he's possibly going to get a big contract because I forget exactly how old he is, but once he leaves the Nationals, he's going to be in his upper 30s, and you don't typically see guys of that age get um get that big of a contract. But Murphy is a special case because late in his career, he's kind of had that resurgence, and really he's not the same hitter that he was early in his career. 36, I think 36 is a number that has popped into my head um, from conversations with, with Ricky Keeler. Um, and uh, just because he's such a student of the game and a student of how to hit, that he will hold a higher value than, you know, it will be an above average hitter. I mean, look how well uh, Jason Worth did this year before he broke his foot um, at the age of 37. I mean, he was putting his OPS plus was around 100, which on the surface doesn't sound great until you realize that he's 38 and putting up league average numbers. Um, and so for Murphy, who's kind of figured out late in his career how to hit, um, of course he's going to hold some value. And the story that she told of, of him going around the clubhouse, I mean, you can't buy that luxury of having, well, you know, I saw this in your swing, and it works. You know, the Red Sox kind of had, the Boston Red Sox kind of had that with Dustin Pedroia to a degree. Um, and so, you know, to have players like that who are willing to coach, you know, are, are worth the extra money. I, I, I think the thing that struck, struck me is, maybe not necessarily what she said, is just how successful this team has been considering all these obstacles in its way. I mean, some of them are, are you know, self-driven, not taking care of the bullpen. But if you were to sit there and say that Wilmer Defoe was your starting left fielder on a team that is uh, 12, 12 games in, ahead in first place and a team that still scores six runs a night, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, the depth that this team has is just incredible. I saw Ray Knight tweet earlier. He said, sometimes injuries aren't necessarily a bad thing or aren't necessarily yeah, a bad thing because right. without these injuries, you wouldn't be seeing guys like Brian Goodwin or Michael Taylor, or Wilmer Defoe having the kind of years that they are. So just the, to see these young players go out and make the most of their opportunities has been a lot of fun this year. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that, that caught my ear was that Jason Worth is due back around the first week of August when he comes off the 60-day DL, which is also a good sign because that brings some stability to, to left field. And then you can really concentrate on uh, – on Brian Goodwin being the everyday center fielder. Um, the news was not as good as on Taylor, though, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too encouraged on Taylor's return with that oblique issue. It's always difficult to come back from, as we saw last year with Ben Revere. So it'll be interesting to see when he comes back and when he does return, how he is able to perform. All right. Well, we'd like to thank Chelsea James of the Washington Post for joining us for the special live mid-afternoon edition of the Dodcast. For Drew Douglas, I'm Ron Jackett. You can follow us on Twitter at District on Deck. Give this video a like and subscribe. We do this after every game day and interviews as needed. Follow us on Facebook at District on Deck. And, of course, districtondeck.com, where I have a piece on the Steven Strasburg injury and what it may mean and co-players of the week. So for Drew and the rest of the and Ricky and the rest of the staff on District on Deck, I'm Ron Juckett. I'll talk to you tomorrow night after the Brewers game.